mutants. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. X-Men Mutants. What is mutation, and how does it give rise to new organisms, new alleles, and new species? In this lecture, we're going to cover mutations, so let's get at it. First off, explain why mutation is a minor violation of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, but a major component of evolution. Give at least one mechanism by which a deleterious mutation can persist in a population, and be able to calculate an equilibrium frequency. Now, I mean that you were just going to be using the equation, not the numbers. First off, mutations are uncommon. Just a little violation. DNA polymerase is actually pretty accurate, and DNA checks itself before it wrecks itself, thus the rate of mutations is very, very low. We're looking at a mouse population here with <coughs> a new allele arising, and the frequency of it in a population is less than 1%. So mutation should be at a very low rate. If mutation is not at a very low rate, then uh, somatic mutations, which are going to be occurring in the body, are going to be occurring way too often causing cancer when the individual is before reproductive age. So an individual that gets cancer and dies of it before reproductive age has no offspring and thus is eliminated from the gene pool. So there is natural selection for a low rate of mutation. Not only that, but gamete mutations should be rare as well. So if they aren't, you're going to have a lot of deleterious mutations. Remember from a previous lecture that most mutations are deleterious or neutral, or some even lethal, so mutations should be a very low rate. However, new alleles are still introduced by mutations, which um, can mean a dominant allele could actually re uh, mutate to a recessive allele, or vice versa, depending on transcription factors and such. So, mutations are going to be rare. Even more rare are mutations that are going to be expressed in the phenotype, because a lot of DNA is simply not transcribed. So DNA that is not transcribed, but has mutations, is neutral, and you're not even going to see that mutation. Over time, however, mutations can slowly uh, change allele frequencies in what we call appreciation. So over time, the frequency of an allele can change gradually. However, the chance of a mutation happening are exactly equal to the chance of that same exact mutation occurring in reverse. So an A to G mutation, for example, can reverse back to a G to A mutation. A thymine dimer can be reversed. Um, so mutations can go back the way they came. Not only that, but if you do have a mutation that results in a different amino acid, it's always possible another mutation can come along and switch it back. So you change a serine to a valine, and then another mutation changes the valine back to a serine. So this is going to result in a kind of equilibrium over time. The mutations can arise and reverse unless there's selection. If there's selection for mutation, then it becomes beneficial. So here we have an example of some Drosophila, uh, your common fruit fly. You have an original inbred stock, and then you have several populations that were created and just allowed to um, exist either on an unstressed medium or a medium with increasing amounts of salt. Now, salt is not good for, for Drosophila in their population. So you have here uh, six different, uh, seven different populations of Drosophila, one of which is the original stock, two of which are um, lines in which mutations were allowed to accumulate, and four of which were, and it, were placed in solutions with 5% sodium chloride, so salt-stressed lines. What we see when we actually stress all of these with salt is that there is 0% survival, 0% offspring, 0, 0 offspring for the original inbred stock. So the original inbred stock with no mutation accumulation dies out when you have 100 when you have 5% sodium chloride is 100% lethal. Your unstressed lines that did have mutations accumulating some of them did get mutations that ended up being beneficial. By chance alone, some of these lines had um, mutations that were beneficial. However, the salt stress lines all had mutations that were beneficial because the mutations had accumulated in the presence of natural selection 
for the ability to withstand salt stress. So here we have two violations of Hardy-Weinberg, and a good explanation of why mutation, although a minor violation of Hardy-Weinberg, becomes a major component of evolution. It's a minor violation of Hardy-Weinberg because it only changes the allele frequency a very little. But it's a major component of evolution because mutation is the source of variation. And that variation is acted on by uh, natural selection if that variation is heritable. You get changes in the allele frequency over time. So you see these populations of Drosophila evolved to be more salt resistant over time because there were mutations present. There can also be a mutation selection balance. Oh, I'm going to want more space for this. A mutation selection balance is the is what allows mutated deleterious alleles to be maintained in a population. So here we have um, spinal muscular atrophy. So spinal muscular atrophy is a relatively rare mutation. However, it's still going to be present in a population of mice here. What it, ha if it is, is it is lethal. So there are not going to be many organisms that will get this mutation and then survive if you have two copies of that recessive allele. It causes neurons to die back from motor, um, from skeletal muscles. The skeletal muscles then atrophy, and the organism is incapable of movement and will die. So in the normal one, they, the neurons stay and can actually function with uh, skeletal muscles. So what we have is we have what's called a mutation uh, equilibrium. And it's going to be hard to write the notes. It's a Q with a little hat on it. And that's your equilibrium frequency. So how frequent is an allele going to be at equilibrium? And that can be determined by calculating the uh, square root of the mutation frequency over the selection gradient. So over the selection gradient, what we have here is we have an allele frequency of 0 0.01 at equilibrium. And we know that the selection gradient is 0 0.9 against. So we can calculate how frequently the mutation actually occurs. And the book goes through this for you, calculating a mu, that's too long, of, uh, what is it, uh, 9.0 times 10 to the negative fifth. So that's how we're going to calculate the equilibrium frequency. We need the equilibrium frequency, we need the mutation rate, and we need a selection gradient. We're going to return to selection gradients later, so I really want to set um, a bit of a foundation. I'm not really like pouring cement for the foundation, I'm just digging this out because we're going to get into selection gradients later. But I want to show you that not all organisms survive, and the rate at which they don't survive is called basically your selection gradient. And this allows us to calculate how, how often a mutation is occurring. So what's causing this equilibrium? Well, the rate of mutation could be equal to the rate of selection. So that would be this 9.0 times 10 to the fifth happens here, and that's going to be divided by the 0.9 is going to result in a, an equilibrium of this, pop, of this gene existing in 0.01. That's Q equals 0.01. So yeah, Q. It's related to Q and P. So this is Hardy-Weinberg stuff still. Okay, so there are other reasons that alleles can persist in a population called the mutation selection balance by heterozygote advantage. This means that heterozygotes are going to have higher fitness. So in a population with homozygotes and heterozygotes, the homozygous recessive allele may be dead. So like cystic fibrosis, it's a very common cause of death in uh, white Caucasians. White Caucasians. Well, yes, Caucasians. Okay. So cystic fibrosis is a cause of death. It is pretty common when you get two alleles for the cystic fibrosis. Um, if you're homozygous, homozygous recessive, then you die. Okay. Homozygous dominant, however, is uh, has a chance of getting typhoid, which it turns out typhoid was very common in um, in Caucasians. Why? Well, because Europeans often lived in cities and Europeans didn't have good sanitation, so you end up with typhoid outbreaks all the time. 
I mean, hashtag Oregon Trail, right? So typhoid fever was a common cause of death in uh, Europeans. Okay, because of bad sanitation. So this bad sanitation uh, was a common cause of death. Cystic fibrosis was a common cause of death. But why does cystic fibrosis persist in the population if it's lethal? Well, it turns out that the hydrozygote has higher resistance to typhoid fever. So this actually, um, the mutation in the protein that causes cystic fibrosis, fibrosis also makes it harder for the typhoid bacterium. I can't remember the name of it right now. Salmonella, I believe. Salmonella typhus, I think. I think the book says. I just forgot. Brain fart. Anyway, um, it's harder for that bacterium to attach to the cell. That's what's going on down here is you have a salmonella attaching to the cell. So we could actually look at this. So you have your, um, your normal and your cystic fibrosis alleles. And you have a heterozygotes, two heterozygotes here. So you got your homozygote dominant, homozygous recessive, and two heterozygotes. This is lethal, so we can just toss that right out. And this is going to be partially lethal. Let me just draw like a half line through here. So that's partially lethal, resulting in more of these in the population, and that can cause this um, equilibrium to be relatively high. So our equilibrium is going to be um, actually equal to 0 0.02. That's just a number I'm getting from the book. So we have 0 0.02 is going to be equal to, and they actually calculated out the, um, the frequency of the uh, mu here as 6.0, oh, what is it, 6.7 times 10 to the 7th. And you can calculate S. If you do, if you take the time to do the math, you're going to find that S is equal to uh, 1.7 times 10 to the negative, what is it, third? Third. Third? Yeah. Third. Uh, basically, negative, it's 0 0.001675. So 1.7 times 10 to negative third is your selection gradient for that. It's present, so you can calculate that there is selection for it, although not a very strong selection. Now let's say there's a lot of typhoid fever going on. You would see far more heterozygotes in the population if there was typhoid fever. So the homozygous, the heterozygote advantage here confers some sort of uh, a rationale for a rare mutation that is lethal to persist in a population. All right. Evolution couldn't progress in the absence of mutation, but Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is violated only a little. I want you to be able to explain this contradiction. Basically, uh, mutation is only going to cause a very small change in allele frequencies, so why is it such a big component of evolution? And how do deleterious mutations persist in populations? And that is, uh, that's a pretty good question to be able to answer as an evolutionary biologist. So check your objectives, and that's mutation. Um, in a future lecture, we're going to talk about, take some mutations and look at the neutral ones as well. Thank you.